Imagine you're an agent navigating through life. You're constantly making decisions while moving forward. At some point, you come across another agent, and you have to decide how to interact with him. You have two strategies. You can either be defective and try to betray him, or you can be cooperative and try to help each other out. And the other agent has the same two strategies available. So let's analyze what are the four possible scenarios and what are the payouts for each agent on each scenario. The first scenario is mutual cooperation. Here, the two agents achieve a high payout because they manage to help each other out. The opposite scenario is mutual defection, where their payouts are significantly reduced because of their destructive behavior. Then we have a scenario where blue defects and red cooperates, in which case blue gets all the payout. And we have the opposite scenario, where red defects and blue cooperates, in which case red gets all the payout. So let's try to analyze which scenario is more likely to occur. Let's start with mutual cooperation, which after all seems to be the most logical scenario, as this maximizes the combined payout of both players. The problem is that, for example, if we look at it from Blue's perspective, then we actually see that Blue has an incentive to deviate his strategy, since the payout for defection is higher than for cooperation, so Blue will change his strategy. Now, the payout of Red has been significantly reduced, and Red now also has an incentive to deviate his strategy, since defection has a greater payout. So we end up with mutual defection. Here we can see the flow of incentives, and unfortunately, we see that we always end up with mutual defection. This is the only scenario in which none of the players have an incentive to deviate their strategy. We call this the Nash equilibrium. This is very unfortunate, because both players could be cooperating and helping each other out, but they end up being defective just because the incentives are not aligned. Fortunately, we can often escape this situation using incentive structures. Cooperative incentive structures are mechanisms that penalize defective behavior and reward cooperative behavior. These penalties and rewards modify the payout of players in a way that aligns the Nash equilibrium with the common good. So this is a scenario with no incentive structures, and this is the same scenario with cooperative incentive structures. Having cooperative incentive structures is fundamental for a society to thrive. Without them, individual agents struggle to cooperate and very often engage in mutually destructive behavior. In fact, one of the distinctive factors of the human species is our ability to cooperate at very large scales. That's something that sets us apart from other species, and it's not that we have a natural ability to cooperate, but we've been able to develop incentive structures that have enabled us to promote cooperation at very large scales. Some of the most ancient incentive structures are belief systems. Some belief systems, like religions, used to act as incentive structures by imposing moral codes that made people believe that they would be sanctioned for their defective behavior and that they would be rewarded for their cooperative behavior. These ancient incentive structures were paramount to promote cooperation at local scales, but they resulted insufficient to promote cooperation in larger communities. In larger communities, not everyone followed the same belief systems, and some people were not even persuaded by any belief system at all. Fortunately, we developed more effective incentive structures that helped us promoting cooperation on a larger scale. Now, cooperative incentives are imposed by modern legislation, which penalizes citizens for their defective behavior, for example, by sending them to jail, and rewards citizens for their cooperative behavior. This works great to promote cooperation on a national scale, but once again, this incentive structure meets some boundaries. This time, the problem is that legislation only acts from governments upon citizens, but does not act upon governments. Under legislation, governments are not sanctioned for their defective behavior, and are not rewarded for their cooperative behavior. This is very problematic, because this makes it very difficult for governments to cooperate, and very often we end up in situations in which the Nash equilibrium is not aligned with the common good. Our inability to create global cooperative incentive structures is preventing us from addressing problems that require global cooperation between governments, like climate change or violent and economic conflict between nations. Promoting global cooperation is one of the most important problems we need to address if we want our societies to thrive. Some intellectuals in the past have advocated for a top-down solution to this problem. This consists of having a one-government world, where one government can impose sanctions and rewards to subordinate governments according to their behavior. 
in the status quo, this is highly unlikely to occur, because this requires either one power to dominate planet Earth, or all governments agreeing to be ruled by a superior government. In this video, I will be proposing an alternative solution. I've called it the Nash Judge. The Nash Judge is a bottom-up mechanism in which sanctions and rewards to governments are imposed by a decentralized network of market participants. In short, the mechanism I propose uses the collective intelligence of a free market to establish the economic sanctions and rewards provided to governments, which incentivizes them to cooperate. This is achieved by issuing tokens that represent the ability of their respective governments to cooperate, and then we let a free market value these tokens. If all this sounds overwhelming, don't worry. The rest of the video will explain this procedure more calmly. Let's first discuss what are the properties that these tokens should have. Let's explore a hypothetical world in which we only have two governments, the blue government and the red government. To establish a cooperative incentive structure, Government tokens should have three properties. The first property is possession, which implies that governments should have a large possession of their respective tokens. So the blue government should own blue tokens and the red government should own red tokens. The second property is magnitude, which implies that the value of such tokens should be of a significant magnitude such that they have an influence over the decision-making of governments. If these tokens are not valuable, then they won't change the decision-making of governments. The third property is correlation, which implies that there should exist a positive correlation between the value of tokens and the ability of their respective governments to cooperate. So if the red government is more cooperative than the blue government, then the price of red tokens should be higher, whereas if the blue government is more cooperative, then the blue tokens should be more valuable. So if these three properties exist, then a cooperative incentive structure is formed. We see that governments are discouraged from being defective, since this will decrease the value of their holdings, and they are encouraged to be cooperative, since this will increase the value of the tokens they own, which then they can use to store value over time or to sell them in exchange of something else in the future. So far, I have only presented these three properties. In the rest of the video, I will present the mechanism I propose to adopt such properties. Let's start with possession, which implies that governments should have a large possession of their respective tokens. This property can be addressed using a smart contract. A smart contract is a computer program that runs on a blockchain. This computer program can be read by everyone, but it can't be modified. This smart contract will contain instructions to generate tokens periodically. The quantity of newly generated tokens will be decreasing over time, and by default, these tokens will be sent to no one so it's almost as if they were never created. However, we give governments the right to claim their respective tokens. They can do so by providing the smart contract the address of an account they own. By doing so, the smart contract will then redirect these tokens to the account of governments. All right, that was a straightforward property. Let's now discuss the second property, which implies that the value of government tokens should be of a significant magnitude such that they have an influence over the decision-making of governments. Before we tackle that, let's present the pricing mechanism of a free market. A minute ago, we saw that smart contracts periodically generate a new supply of government tokens. An initial supply is also provided to other market participants. By default, every participant will have different expectations on the future value of government tokens, so some people will want to sell their tokens, while others will want to buy more. The sellers induce a supply of tokens, and the buyers a demand. Supply and demand are opposing forces, and any imbalance between supply and demand will lead to a change in price. For example, if more people want to sell their tokens, then the supply momentarily increases, which reduces the price. The lower price then balances supply and demand, and after a while we reach a new equilibrium where supply equals demand with a lower price. Alternatively, if more people want to buy tokens, then the demand momentarily increases, which drives up the price. The higher price then balances supply and demand, and after a while we reach a new equilibrium where supply equals demand with a higher price. So this only explains the pricing mechanism of a free market, but it doesn't provide any rigorous proof that the value of tokens can reach a certain magnitude such that they have a significant influence over the decision-making of governments. Ultimately, the market value of tokens is set by market participants, 
So we can expect that if market participants believe that the nudge judge mechanism can promote cooperation at a larger scale and that it can be a fundamental tool for the future of our species, then the market value will be high. Instead, if many participants believe that there exist fundamental flaws in the properties of this mechanism, then the price will be low. In other words, the price of tokens should reflect the potential of this mechanism to provide an intrinsic value to humanity. Let's revise the third property, which implies that there should exist a positive correlation between the value of tokens and the ability of their respective governments to cooperate or to behave in accordance with global interests. We have seen that the price is dictated by the laws of supply and demand of a free market. Now we can come up with a metric to measure cooperation. Let's call it the cooperation score, and it represents the ability of a government to cooperate. This metric is a bit more tricky to measure, because we humans don't have an oracle that tells us which governments are more cooperative. We lack access to objective reality, and we only perceive reality through our own subjective lens, and this lens is different for everyone. Despite our disagreements, we can still try different ways to measure the ability of governments to cooperate. For example, we can establish the cooperation score by using a data-driven approach that encompasses data that has an impact on global interests like carbon emissions or military activity. We can also have alternative systems that include human judgment in the loop, like a network of voters that are incentivized to provide honest answers by being financially rewarded for doing so. Since there are countless ways to measure cooperation, what I propose is to have a marketplace of different systems to establish cooperation scores. Then, we allow each system to introduce its own supply of tokens and we let the free market decide which one is best. Now that we have both a cooperation score and a price, we can introduce a new metric that describes the ratio between the two. We can call this the cooperation to price ratio. This metric is supposed to be higher for those governments whose ability to cooperate is not reflected in their token price. For example, if the blue government has a higher cooperation score, but the price of blue tokens is the same as the price of red tokens, then this difference should be reflected in the cooperation to price ratio. The idea is that then we can use a smart contract to provide some form of monetary reward to token holders of governments that are scored higher in the cooperation to price ratio. This monetary reward is provided in the form of global tokens. I will address in a minute the concept of global tokens, so please bear with me. Now, if a monetary reward is provided to blue token holders, then the demand for blue tokens will increase relative to the demand for red tokens. This itself will increase the price of the blue tokens, which will make the cooperation to price ratio decrease over time. After a while, the two ratios will converge and the monetary reward will be split evenly among the two governments. Okay, so now let's take a look at the prices again. We see that this time we have achieved a positive correlation between the cooperation scores and the prices. Here, it's important to mention that we still entitle free markets the responsibility to establish the price of tokens, but we can use this additional mechanism to establish soft levels of correlation that are necessary to reduce speculation. Let's now address the concept of global tokens and why are they valuable. The idea is once again to use smart contracts to generate a new supply of government tokens, but this time, the new supply is not provided to governments, but it's instead used by a smart contract to sell these government tokens in exchange for global tokens. By doing so, the supply of government tokens increases and the demand of global tokens increases. The net outcome of that procedure is an injection of value from government tokens to global tokens. So the last piece of the puzzle is that this smart contract then uses the global tokens that has bought to redistribute them according to the cooperation to price ratio. All right, so this completes the overview. Let's recap. We've seen a bottom-up incentive structure that utilizes the collective intelligence of a free market to judge and reward governments according to their behavior. This mechanism acts as an incentive structure that has the potential to promote cooperation between governments on a global scale. Cooperative incentive structures are fundamental for our progress as a species, not only to address current problems, but also to prevent future ones. The exponential growth of technology will soon bring us very powerful tools like artificial general intelligence or genetic engineering. If such technologies fall in the hands of a society with poor incentive structures, 
their negative consequences could be devastating. The impact of such technologies depends greatly on the incentive structures we have in place. This is why it is paramount to use our best and brightest to develop them. I invite you to read my white paper and to expand on it. I warned you that it hasn't been heavily supervised. I've written there my honest ideas and they might contain major flaws. But my intention with it is not to present a final idea, but rather an early prototype that is primitive enough to encourage you to redesign it.